Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Women in Innovation Building Success webinar. Um, today's webinar, we'll be discussing public relations. Um, this is the fifth webinar in our series. If you wanted to view any of the other ones, please sign up for our newsletter. I'll give you details of that towards the end, um, and you'll be able to access them all via um, what we share in our newsletter. So I'd like to introduce today um, our speaker who is Miranda Barham. She is a PR specialist with 20 years experience um, from a wide range of industries and working with both agencies and in-house. She's also a registered member of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations. So I'm going to hand over to Miranda to actually deliver our webinar. Thank you very much and hi everybody. Great to be with you today. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I run a small boutique consultancy and we principally work with organisations to help them build and manage their reputations to raise capital and grow successful businesses. So hopefully that applies to many of you today. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, um, as a consultancy, I've worked with a lot of financial services and financial services related firms, particularly around institutional investment issues and uh, also um, in the ESG sector, so environment, social governance. So for all of those um, good businesses that are trying to influence and make the world a better place. I work with a couple of associates. And if you want to learn more about me and my background, I've included my LinkedIn uh, information there if you click on my name. So what I thought I would do today, I'm just going to start pretty quickly so that we can get through to the second half of the presentation, which has got more of the hands on tips and things that I will be useful, but I just want to frame the context up front. Um, so bear with me and you can always let me know if I'm going too fast. So basically, I wanted to start with an introduction from the Chartered Institute of Public Relations of what PR is. It is essentially about reputation and managing your reputation and communicating with your publics, which are your essential stakeholders. Now, a good reputation is a very valuable asset for any firm that obviously wants to grow and wants to attract investment. So on the consumer customer side, research tells us that 87% of consumers take into account reputation of a company when making purchasing decisions. And that for companies they trust, so if you've got a good reputation and you've earned your consumer trust, people will be more likely to spend a premium with you, they'll believe you in terms of your advertising and also give you the benefit of, a doubt, of the doubt in times of crisis. Similarly, reputation, a good reputation is a driver of value and reputation actually makes up quite a significant percent of market capitalization of FTSE companies. And of course that applies across the board. So reputation is does create value and it's worth managing well. So public relations obviously has many facets. We're not covering off all of them today. We're going to focus on media relations today. And I know obviously social media is a, is a very close uh, adjunct to media relations. And I know that you've got another webinar coming up on that. So I'm not going to touch on that today. I'm also not going into media training, but obviously a number of the tips and information that I'll share uh, does come from media training expertise. So why do media relations? Media relations is a very uh, economical and effective way of telling your story to numerous stakeholders. So the people you care about, whether those are customers, whether those are investors, whether those might be partners, people in your sector. And by being proactive with your media relations, it allows you to shape and control your company's narrative. So it allows you to say what you want to say rather than other people uh, having opinions and comments, etc., filling the void um, and defining your company for you. Obviously, it builds your brand, it builds your reputation, it gets your products known, 
And if you're open and transparent about your communications, you can build trust with consumers, investors, etc. So think about what your business objectives are and get your media relations to support. The other point, and again, we're not going to go into it today, but in terms of crisis management and man handling issues, which may not be about your company, it could be about your sector, but having good relations with the media and open dialogue with them will help to build trust, a foundation of trust for when things go wrong and will help you manage it. Okay, so you've decided you want to do some media relations. You need to think about your business and whether you're ready for PR. So on the product and service side and also on the people side. So does your, does your product or service work in the way that it's meant to? Are you ready to show it to people? Uh, can people go and purchase it, acquire it, get access to it? And is that channel sufficiently set up? Are you, are you ready to show off your product? And can people go somewhere for further information on it? So have you got your website set up basically? And then you need to think about the people side. So media relations, it can be quite time intensive. Do you have the time and the capacity to deal with media inquiries? And then all the inquiries that you might get from, from customers, from investors and others actually reading the media articles. If you've got a team or co-founders, do other people in your company agree that you're ready for PR and to have a spotlight shown on your company? And if you've got more than one spokesperson, are you, are you aligned? Are you saying the same thing? Are you being consistent? Or is the spokesperson being consistent with say the salesperson? You don't want to say something different to your customers than you're actually saying in the media. And then, of course, you need to make sure that you've got the essential materials for working with the media ready to hand. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So if you are ready and you want to start your planning your media relations strategy, you need to think about what are your company's objectives? Why are you doing this? And what do you want to achieve with your campaign? You also need to think about who is it you're really talking to? So remember, media is a channel. And through the media, you are speaking to the people you care about the most, probably your customers, or clients. So what sorts of media would they be reading? So those are the media that you want to focus on. And then you need to think about what's the story I'm going to tell them? What are the key points I want to convey? How am I describing my company? How am I talking about my product and service? Um, why is this the right time to talk about this or to launch this new um, initiative into the market. You need to be clear on who is going to deliver this message to the media and who's the right person to do it. And you might have different people for different sorts of media. Um, and just when you're thinking about your business objectives, think about the timing. If you look at the next 12 months, you might have particular milestones in place that you want the media relations to support. So try and plan your media relations campaign around your business timing. So materials, you will need some essential materials for working with the media. Um, back in the old days, we used to have something called a company backgrounder, which would be one to two pages all about the company. Uh, nowadays, we have websites and websites are pretty good. So make sure that your website is updated. That will provide uh, information to the media about who you are and what you do. Make sure it's clear and it makes sense and it gives sufficient depth. Also, LinkedIn profiles for the spokesperson and potentially for the company. It's just a, it's a handy reference for journalists to look at to learn more about you. You need to be ready to provide a biography of the spokesperson that shows that why they've got their expertise and they're suitable and interesting for the journalist to speak to. And then normally you'd be going to, to the media with either a press release or some sort of pitch. Maybe you're trying to get an interview or contribute an article. So make sure that whatever that is, you're ready for that. Many media will want imagery, not all of them. And it depends on what you're discussing. If you're talking about a B2B service, there may not be imagery. But clearly, if you're talking about consumer product or some sort of physical product, or some sort of initiative perhaps that impacts people, it's really helpful to have imagery. So, or potentially video, especially if you're speaking to broadcast media. 
You want to have some Q&A for the spokesperson so that uh, they can anticipate um, questions that you're going to be asked and also the answers that you might want to give and the questions that you might not want to be asked and how you're going to handle those. Then it's also a good idea to have a list of talking points. So you know the points that you want to cover, you know the types of things you want to say and convey. Um, and then it doesn't hurt to have some quick facts as well, just some bullet points some quick facts, maybe about your company, but more likely about your sector or about the market. And this just can give the journalist in a, in a quick snapshot um, background context on why your solution is important. What, how, what is the scale of the problem that you're trying to fix? Now, in all of your materials, before you start writing them, you need to sit back and think about, okay, what are the key messages I really want to include? And those key messages might be nuanced slightly differently for different sorts of stakeholders. So although fundamentally, you're not going to be saying something contradictory or conflicting, but obviously there might be a slightly different phrasing uh, for say investors versus in consumers. It's also important to remember that materials for the media are not sales materials. Don't make them salesy and marketing -y. Maybe you have some sales materials and you think that's a good starting point and it may well be for media materials, but you need to strip out all of the sales type um, vocabulary. So if you think about somebody like the BBC, you know, they, they report facts and they have to be neutral that's sort of the information that you need to give as well. It needs to be fairly neutral. I'm not saying don't be passionate in your, in your information and your opinions that you provide the media, but uh, don't make it overly salesy. Obviously it needs to be clear, it needs to be understandable, it needs to be succinct, and you're dealing with professional writers, journalists obviously, so make sure what you give them in the written format is also uh, professionally written. So if English isn't your first language or you're not very good at writing, get some help, consider using a professional writer. Journalists are so busy nowadays uh, and under so much pressure, if, you're, if your pitch is not well put together, they're not going to spend any time on it and they probably won't read all of it. So just briefly, it's worth thinking about the media landscape in the UK. Um, doing media relations in the UK is great because the UK really is a global media centre. You'll find uh, with a lot of the vertical market publications, um, global publications often have offices or are based here. So it does give you a very broad spectrum of media to approach. Um, broadsheet, I think we all know what those are, the Times, the Financial Times, the Guardian, etc. There's limited space, they are newspapers, so you have to go to them with something that is news. Very important to remember that, and it's got to be very relevant to whatever is going on today, otherwise they're not going to have space to fit it in. Wires you might be slightly less familiar with, but Reuters, Bloomberg, they supply news to other publications, as well as to many companies who would subscribe to the news services. So stories that get onto the wires travel very far. So if you can get your news story onto a wire service, that's great. It's going to be read by a lot of people and picked up by a lot of other publications. Broadcast, straightforward. I, if you're starting out with media relations, I leave broadcast till last because obviously doing a live television interview or even radio interview, it takes a little bit of practice. Practice with the print media first. And then of course we've got other news outlets such as regional newspapers and online media and then vertical market. So whether it's a tech sector, um, uh, you know, startup, angel investment sector, institutional property, transportation, there are always many publications out there and that can be a good way to start. Often those, um, those media will have more space and more capacity for sector specific stories and perhaps stories that may not make the news cut for the other media. Do remember that media is big business and highly competitive. So the journalists are having to write stories that are going to sell papers. So it's, it's hard to get a story 
um, that they will pick up. You have to really uh, think about what is news, what is relevant, is this going to is this going to be useful for the journalist? And the other thing is that most media are really short staffed. Um, so the journalists are under a lot of time pressure and they won't give a lot of attention to media stories. So you need to make it as catchy and as easy for them to understand as quickly as possible in order for them to consider it. And of course, every organization wants to be in the broadsheets and in the wires, so it is competitive. Journalists will receive a lot of emails every day, so you really have to work to make your stand out. So interacting with the media, um, generally there's three formats that we would go to the media with, press, either a press release, a contributed article, or you're pitching for an interview. And then there's different types of contribution, whether it's news, whether you're hoping to input into a journalist feature article, whether you're providing industry commentary and opinion piece, maybe you've got a physical product that you want to have reviewed, or you're doing some sort of consumer promotion. There's different types of contribution. What's really key is you think about, okay, this is what I want to say. What's the, what's the best way to convey this? And which is the most appropriate media you know, not every story is going to be relevant for every media or every journalist. So try and research which is the best media title and at that media title, which is the best journalist. You know, perhaps it's journalist has already written something similar or has an interest in that particular topic. Approach them. And remember, it's not just about this one hit that you're trying to get, one story you're trying to place. What you're trying to do is build a long-term relationship in the same way that you would with clients. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to look at each of these three uh, formats, so the press release, the interview, and the contributed article, to understand a little bit more how you might put that together. The press releases, Again, it's a news announcement, so you only use press releases for something that is news. And they follow a pretty standard format. In the first paragraph, you've got the who, what, when, how, and why. So you need to summarize the story very succinctly. Subsequent paragraphs will give a bit more detail to the story, provide more market context. We'll have some quotes from spokespeople towards the end. And then after the main part of the release is finished, you'll have the notes editor section, which will include a boilerplate, which is a little paragraph on your company, and contact details so the media know how to get in touch with you if they need to. I've just got a couple of examples here, which we'll take a very quick look at. Um, obviously, your competitors and other um, media in your sector, or other um, companies in your sector, rather, will have press releases on their website. So it's always worth taking a look at those. You're going to find good examples and bad examples. So um, don't necessarily uh, copy anything you see. So here is uh, an example from Del Deliveroo. It's in their newsroom on their website. Um, you can see they've obviously got a picture. They've got a title here, which tells you very clearly what's happened. They're creating a tech hub. Uh, and they're acquiring a Scottish software design and development firm. So again, you can see the first paragraph very clearly summarizes what they've done. So it's the main news point. And then the subsequent paragraph underneath provide a bit of context about why they've acquired this firm and their previous relationship. And then you can see at the end, we've got a whole string of quotes from various parties involved. We've got the notes to editors section. And then here you can see they've included a link and I would expect that to be a link to a photograph, uh, a high resolution photograph. So if print media wanted to pick it up, it could do so. Then one other press release I wanted to show you uh, just very quickly because this is a PDF on Lloyds Bank website and you can see how to properly set out your press release for the media in terms of the document that you would send to them. So you have your logo 
uh, you have a clear title, you can use some bullet points under the title to call out specific points that you're making in your press release. So these are the main news nuggets. And you can see how to write the, um, the location and the date. The first paragraph, short and sweet and straightforward. Then we've got all of our context, we've got our quotes again. And we've got the word ends after the main part of the press release. And then we've got the notes to editors underneath. Right, so that's press releases. Interviews. Usually uh, an interview is something that you'll be approaching the media to pitch or you will be doing an interview because a journalist has somehow come across your firm and wants to ask you about developments either at your firm or in your sector. So again, it is important to understand uh, what is the publication, who reads it, so you can phrase what you're saying, be relevant to that particular audience. Clearly, if a journalist contacts you and asks you for an interview, you need to understand what is it they're interested in, what's the interview about, what do they want to cover, who else are they speaking to? How long do they need to stay on the phone to you? If it's a broadcast interview, be careful, is it live or is it pre-recorded? If it's pre-recorded, it means they're going to edit it. So then you need to be very careful, very succinct in how you answer questions in order to avoid uh, editing out the important bits. Um, and with print media, you want to check whether or not you'll have an opportunity to check your quotes for accuracy. But just a point on this, um, more senior, dare I say, very professional journalists will not give you the opportunity to check your quotes. So don't even ask for the board sheets or for the wires. However, probably for the other or the broadcast, but for the other media, it's probably worth seeing if you've got an opportunity to check your quotes for accuracy. That means if they've written down what you've said and they wrote it down wrongly, you can change it. It doesn't mean you can change what you actually said. If you said something, you can't change it. Preparing for an interview, an interview is like any meeting. So you need to be prepared. You need to think about what is it I really want to say. Write down three or four key points. Think about the questions that you're going to be asked, questions that you might want to be asked, so go back to your Q&A. If you're talking about uh, complex technology, try and, try and use analogies to, to illustrate so that the journalists can understand. And remember, journalists are not experts, they're generalists. They have to write up so many different things. So even if it's a tech sector journalist or a you know, specialist financial services type of journalist, it doesn't mean that they really understand uh, all of the different facets of that particular technology or that type of financial services product. So make sure that you make it very clear. Even if the journalist doesn't ask you to or doesn't admit that they don't know, chances are they don't know. And if you can't make it clear, your point is going to be lost on them. So don't be afraid of over explaining. And obviously, you can use data to back up what you're saying. That's always really valuable. So if a journalist calls you and asks you for comment, try and get some time to gather your thoughts. So call them back. They work to tight deadlines, so call them back pretty promptly. Don't expect them to show you the full article. Um, and as I mentioned, only some will share quotes. Be very careful of journalists putting words in your mouth. So sometimes they'll summarize, ah, so what you're saying is X, Y, Z. If you say yes to that, they can quote you on what they've just said, not what you've just said. So your answer to that needs to be, what I'm saying is, and then you reiterate in your own words. And obviously if you've got a no-go area, an area that you absolutely don't want to talk about or get drawn into, don't. Don't let yourself get drawn into that. You need to close it off by saying, well, actually, what we're here to discuss today is, and then go ahead to make one of your key, mess, key messages points. <coughs> so 
One of the, um, the last um, uh, format piece was a contributed article. Contributed article, again, it's not, an, it's not a sales opportunity, it's a thought leadership opportunity. And we love that word, thought leadership in, in PR. Basically, you're demonstrating that you're an expert in a particular area, and this area is of interest to your, your clients, your various stakeholders, and you're showcasing your expertise. That's what a contributed article or an opinion piece needs to be about. It's not about a particular product or service. Generally, media will have guidelines for what they want from contributed articles. So make sure you find out if they do, make sure you read them and you follow them. Also bear in mind that editors will have the editorial license to edit what you give them. If they make substantial edits, they should share it with you, um, but they may not. So whatever you want to share with the media, whether it's an article or a press release or to get an interview, you need to send a, a pitch in your email. You email the journalist. Your pitch needs to be punchy, needs to outline the story, needs to make it very clear what they are going to get from the opportunity and it needs to offer an appropriate person. Now, always when you're working with the media, you know, bearing in mind the fact that they're generally interested in news, it needs to be new, but it's also ideal if it can tie into whatever sort of news is happening at that time. So think about what's going on in your sector. Think about what the media, that particular publication or journalist perhaps has recently covered and has an interest in and how you can link it back to that. And think about major global trends, things like climate change. You know, every media is covering climate change at the moment. So it might seem a little tangential, but try and think about how and be creative in thinking about how your story and what you're doing can tie into some of these big global issues. Okay, so there's some, there's some fundamental rules for working with the media. Um, first of all, when you're speaking with a journalist, basically everything is what we call on the record. That means they can write about, uh, you know, they can, they can write down everything you tell them and they've got license to print it. If you want to tell a trusted journalist something that you don't want them to print or you don't want attributed to you, there is background and off the record. And you need to stay, say these phrases before you actually tell the journalist what you're going to say. So background means it can't be attributed to you. They can still write whatever you say, but they can't attribute it to you. If you tell a journalist something off the record, that means that it's not a publication. That's just for them to understand about something in more depth, it is not for publication. So make sure you understand those and make sure you use them as appropriate. You can't go back to the journalist at the end of the conversation and say, by the way, that bit I said about whatever was off the record. You have to state it prior to making your comments. Under embargo and exclusives are something we use for press releases. So perhaps you, you are planning to send out a press release on Tuesday. Tuesday's a good day to send media press releases. However, there are a number of journalists that you want to send it to early. So under embargo, so perhaps a Thursday prior to the Tuesday, so that they have a chance to review the story in more detail, think about it, conduct interviews, have their article written and ready, which they would then publish on the Tuesday at the same time you send out the press release. And providing press releases under embargo to media is really, really helpful. And I think it's becoming more and more common because journalists just don't have time. You know, you could have the best news story, but if it's a big news day and there's many other announcements that they're getting, they don't necessarily have time to write up your story. So this is a way of allowing them more time. Similarly, an exclusive is when you go to one publication and you offer them the exclusive. So they might get the press release early on your embargo. They have a chance to write it up and publish on Tuesday when everyone else is just getting the press release. Obviously, if it's exclusive, you're only going to the one media, you're not going to multiple. 
Um, if in your press release you are mentioning third parties, it's always courteous to share the release with them beforehand, before you send it out. And certainly if you're quoting them, they need to approve their quotes. Timing of press releases, they should always go out in the morning, first thing in the morning, um, and to all media at approximately the same time, unless, as I've stated, you're using the embargoed announcement. You need to respect each journalist and editor's editorial discretion. They're not, you know, they just can't publish everything they get. And even though it seems that your story might be perfect for them, they might not be able to do it. If they say no, they say no. If they've got questions about the press release or whatever it is you're sending to them, make sure you're responsive. If you're sending out the press release on the Tuesday, don't book a full day of meetings. Make sure you're on email and by your phone so that you can respond to journalists as soon as their inquiries come in. Forget Fridays. Fridays are a bad day for contacting media. It's okay if you're going under embargo to them, but sending them press releases on a Friday is a big no-no. Unless it's a hot news item and you want it in the Sunday papers, but otherwise, generally, the media will forget about it by the time Monday comes around. So it's a bit of a lost opportunity. Respect journalist deadlines. Publications work to really tight deadlines. Daily newspapers obviously have daily, daily deadlines. For example, you wouldn't call um, a broadcast um, sorry, a broadsheet journalist after 3 p.m. because that's going to be really close to their deadline. They're writing up their articles from the research that day. Obviously, if you get a question and you don't know the answer or you don't want to answer it, don't lie. Either say you don't know or, as we previously uh, discussed, don't get drawn into areas you don't want to talk about. So don't lie. And I'm afraid with media relations, it's good fun and it's great when it goes well, but it is hard work. So you'll need to have quite a bit of resilience and persistence in order to get your stories released. And lastly, just before we move into questions, some quick tips. Uh, hopefully I've covered a lot of these before. It might sound obvious, but actually it's really important. Do read the publication before calling. Um, it's, uh, it's important to understand what the publication covers and what sort of things they're interested in. Make sure you understand the news cycle. Um, as I mentioned, broadsheets and, and daily papers, they've, they've got a very quick turnaround of news, so you need to adapt to that. Or if you're dealing with a weekly magazine, obviously it's a bit different. Um, try and target the person that's going to be most interested in your story, so just because the publication has covered your story, it doesn't mean everybody there is going to be interested in that topic, so try and find the right journalist. Don't say anything to a journalist you don't want to see in print. This is really important. Even say you're doing an interview and the interview is finished and the journalist is standing by the lift and you're about to see them out, just be careful what you say. Obviously, it's important to know your subject and your topic and if you don't, maybe you're, the not, you're not the best spokesperson. So try and work out. You might have other people in your team who know about a particular aspect in more detail and they might make a better spokesperson if that's what the journalist is interested in. Um, and I think we've probably covered all the other topics, so I think we can probably move on to questions now. Thanks, Miranda. So if you do have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box. Um, I've got one or two um, that I'm gonna ask. So, um, Miranda, if you are looking to send um, a press release out, how do you go about finding the contact details for that specific media? Sure, good question. So, um, and thank you for asking that because I didn't touch on media lists. So when you're preparing your press release, you also need to think about the media that you want to send it to. And you will need to put together what we call a media list which is a list of titles and a list of contacts so that you can send it out. And basically you'll have to research. So you can go onto the publications websites and you can have a look and see, usually they have contact details for journalists, at least they have the email address, sometimes phone numbers as well. 
and you'll need to compile your own Excel spreadsheet. Now, if you want, there are companies that uh, do this for you and provide a service. Um, Gorkana would be one, and there's probably a load of others where you can buy essentially access to media databases. These have pros and cons. And so, for example, it's not cheap. So I suggest if you are starting out and you're a small company, a very small business, and you know you need to be fairly focused with the sort of media that you're targeting anyway, I would actually suggest just making your own list. Um, the other problem, if you're in say a particular niche area um, and you wanted to uh, reach out to media publications in that niche area, uh, you would you will probably find that these sorts of media databases actually don't cover magazines that you want them to cover, or they might have one title but miss out the other 10. So it can be a bit frustrating. Um, Emma's asked, will the recording be made available afterwards? Yes, it will, Emma, and we'll make sure it's circulated around. Um, another question for you, Miranda. Um, so occasionally um, things like Trade Press do special features on a specific topic. Um, and they cover usually a wide range of different companies that provide them kind of services. How do you go about finding out that that special feature um, or topic of area is going to be covered? So a lot of trade magazines will publish what we call editorial calendars. So if you look at the, if you go onto their website and you look at the advertising sections of the website, so for people that want to advertise, often they'll have what's called a media kit. And that media kit will describe the publication and it will show the readership numbers and, and who reads the publication. And that's obviously very interesting information. But they will also um, have often, not always, often an editorial calendar. And that editorial calendar will lay out for the year what that, you know, the different features and the different supplements that that magazine is going to have. And that's a great way of seeing ahead of time where your company could offer commentary or contribute. Um, now, publications don't always follow these editorial calendars or they're not always available. And sometimes it's a question of building a relationship with the editor or with one of the journalists to find out what's coming up. But that's obviously um, something that takes a little bit of time to do. Uh, you, but you can always you can always call and introduce yourself and, and your company and you can find out um, you know whether they're planning anything that might be relevant to your sector. Some journalists are more open to that, whereas others are less open. It just depends. Generally speaking, trade publications, vertical markets, they tend to be pretty open to approaches. Brilliant. Um, and also, if you are featured in a magazine or an editorial and they print something incorrect about your company, what what can you do with the software? Unfortunately, this does happen with some frequency. Um, and by all means, call them. Call the journalist that wrote the, the piece. Try and get through to that particular journalist. Explain to them, you know, don't be angry or upset, but just ex because mistakes happen, uh, we all make mistakes. And just explain to them that whatever it is is incorrect and what the correct phrasing should be and they will likely correct it now there are times where people feel that something's been misrepresented if it's clearly something totally inaccurate and wrong they will definitely change it if you don't like the way that something's been presented and you feel it's misleading they may not and so there may be a bit of pushback from them and ultimately then you've got to consider the long-term relationship with the media and the journalist. So it's, you've got to make a judgment call. Thanks, Miranda. Um, the last question that I've got at the moment, um, but if there's any other questions um, from the participants, please put them through in the Q&A box because we still do have a little bit of time if you want to ask anything. Um, so a lot of, um, companies collect the kind of value of of the media that they gather from um sending press releases out etc 
is this worthwhile doing? Um, what kind of value would that be for the company? Sorry, I'm not sure I completely understood the question. Sorry, um, so that's probably me reading that out incorrectly. Um, so I believe that there's, there's tools like the AVE, so Advertising Equivalency. Um, oh, right, right, right. Okay. Companies gather. What is the value of that to the companies? Yeah, um, look, there's lots of different ways to measure your media relations campaign. Um, the advertising equivalent is considered quite old fashioned. So um, in, in PR, years ago, people would look at the column inches that you know, the media story has obtained and look at the comparable price that you would pay if you wanted to put an advertisement in publication. It's considered a little bit old fashioned. And really, I think nowadays, when you talk about measurement, one of the things to look at is, what are you actually trying to achieve? So business, um, media relations should really support the business. So if you've got business objectives of, uh, for, for example, I um, work with a private equity fund that invests in residential housing. And one of the things that they were particularly keen on was getting known amongst the house builders so that they could um, purchase houses. And so one of, the, one of the measurement factors we looked at was, well, are the house builders calling my client to see whether or not they want to buy their houses? So there's all sorts of things, you know, it could be the number of customers that call, the number of new business inquiries, the number of hits you get to your website. But really, I think the measurement should be around what is it actually doing for your business? Perfect. So um, I don't think we've got any more questions. Um, is there any other points that you'd like to get across, Miranda, before we close off the webinar? Um, well, I, is it possible to ask everybody a question? I'm just wondering how many people um, who, who are thinking about media relations are doing so in order to support their fundraising? If you can type your answers into the boxes, into the either Q and A box or the chat box, that would be fantastic. So I've got a couple of yeses. Yeah, yeah, quite a few people have said yeah, they've done mm -hmm. public relations to um, support fundraising. Yeah, right. Great. So, you know, with, with media relations, it does take time. So make sure that you are doing media relations well ahead of any fundraising milestones. Because media is something that takes a while to build up. You've got to build the relationships with the, with the journalists. They've got to get familiar with your offering and why it's important and how it fits into the sector. So, you know, if you're planning on doing, say, Series B fund, going for Series B funding in nine months' time, now is a good time to sort of start thinking about media relations. Don't, don't leave it. Um, and you can, you can start to build up sort of slowly and surely. And the other thing is to think about, obviously, in your sector, it's, it's very obvious. You, you'll know your, you know, the, the key vertical market publications. You obviously know all the... Um, the, the broadsheet and, and the big media in the UK. But have a think about the sorts of media that are being read by angel investors and VCs and start trying to explore ways to perhaps get into those sorts of media or get in front of those, um, those people. Brilliant. And I've just got one last question to ask. So how many press releases are too many or too little to one specific media outlet? Like how, how many should you actually send to them before it becomes too many to send or you're not really retaining that kind of um, good relationship with them? Well, it's important that press releases are used for news. So it does depend how much news your company has. Um, I, I would imagine that um, for a smaller business, it's unlikely you're going to have more than one a month and even that uh, is probably quite regular but it does depend on what sort of business you are what you don't want to be doing at any stage is sending 
media unnecessary communication. So if you're just sort of desperately trying to see uh, coverage in the media by making up press releases that really aren't news and that really aren't about anything substantial, whether you send them one or ten, it's probably slightly annoying for them because it's it's just an email then that they didn't need to read. Um, so it's really what I don't. It's hard to sort of say. Oh, there's a magic number. It's more about the content of both press releases and what's in there. And I think the other thing um, as well, which will help you, is when you are sending out press releases, uh, it's important to follow them up. So don't send them to journalists and expect journalists to get the email and read it and write about it. That happens relatively rarely. Because journalists get so much, uh, so many press releases and so many approaches, they're just not able to get to all of their emails. So if, if you know that your press release should be particularly interesting to a particular journalist, once you've sent it to them, leave it a couple of hours and pick up the phone and talk to them and see if they uh, received it, be prepared to run through in sort of 10 seconds what the story or the news item is and see how interested they are. And that will also give you some feedback on how newsy and um, useful your press releases are and it will also give you some feedback on perhaps the sorts of things that the journalist might like to hear more about so that can be a very useful exercise and okay I've got one more question um, can you start approaching even as a startle absolutely um, you've just got to make sure you're ready and that you've got something interesting to say you know, journalists will be delighted to talk to you as long as you've got something really interesting to say. So it is, and you know, uh, without knowing what your um, your sector is, but again, if, if you're a small startup but you've developed some really interesting technology that solves a global world problem, yeah, the media are going to be interested. They might not cover it as a new story immediately if you don't have any clients or you know case studies of it yet but then certainly be interested in following it along. Perfect so that's the end of the questions and um, i let Miranda just talk you through her contact details because I know that's the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Here they are. Um, I'm really uh, happy to answer any questions that any of you uh, might come up with after today's presentation. So please feel free to reach out to me. And I'm just going to talk to you very briefly about what we've got coming up next in the Women in Innovation series. So um, on the 10th of December, and um, Miranda already mentioned it, we are running a social media webinar and um, covering off all kinds of elements of different social media and how to really use that to benefit your company. We're doing a financial planning webinar on the 17th of December. I mentioned earlier our newsletter, if you want to sign up for the newsletter, that's the link to do so. And there's also a Women in Innovation online community where you'll find a bank of resources there um, and there's a chance to network and um, collaborate with, with other women in innovation. Um, and if you want to contact me directly, that is also my email address. So. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much, Miranda, for your insights um, and answering all them questions. Um, and we will hopefully see you at our next webinar. Thank you all for joining again. Thank you.